Hey guys, in this video we're going to be doing an overview on some basics behind hydraulic systems, namely the master cylinder. So we're going to have a, we should have an idea of what the master cylinder is and what it does. This is going to be generating the pressure necessary to actually, uh, the hydraulic forces needed to apply the brakes at each individual wheels, whether we're talking about the calipers or the wheel cylinders. And we know that whenever we step on the brake pedal, and the driver depresses the brake pedal, the vehicle magically slows down. and What's responsible for that is going to be a master cylinder that's not exactly like this because this is an older type and we'll talk about this in just a second. And we're certainly not talking about a more complex system like an electrohydraulic braking system or electric brakes. We're, we're not going to be talking about that. We're sticking with the basics right now to kind of understand what's going on inside of here. So driver depresses the brake pedal and whenever they do that, basically you're going to have a push rod and here is my push rod simulation. So driver depresses the brake pedal, they're going to be moving a push rod and that's usually going to be coming out of a brake assist component like a brake booster or hydro boost system. And again, I'm generalizing, we're not talking about anything complicated right now. So whenever that happens, driver depresses the brake pedal and in turn what that's going to do is it's going to operate this master cylinder and it's going to be moving these internal pistons inside of here. And these pistons are what's going to generate the necessary pressure to actually apply either the brake calipers or the wheel cylinders which spread the pistons outward. Uh, regardless, it is taking advantage of Pascal's law which states that fluid in a confined area uh, any pressure that's transmitted can be transmitted throughout without loss of the entire system as long as the system is enclosed and that is because fluid is incompressible now technically technically it does compress a very very slight amount but it's it's negligible we're not going to be talking about anything crazy in that regard so to kind of help illustrate that point on what's going on inside of here I have these syringe setups like so. Let's move this master cylinder out the way. And right here, this can represent our master cylinder assembly. They're just two glass syringes with a movable plunger like so. So this one's going to represent our master cylinder, which is going to be our driver applying the brake pedal over here, which is going to move this push rod. I'm just going to move this little syringe plunger in and out, right? And on this end, we're going to have our caliper and, <coughs> excuse me, and whenever the driver depresses the brake pedal, ultimately this piston will come out and apply the brake pads against the rotor. And this is only one part of the equation, unless we're talking about a floating rotor, but we're, we're not talking about that right now. So I'm gonna hook this up to our hydraulic line right here. And whenever I depress the pedal, let's see if I can get this all in one shot. I'm gonna have to kind of hold this with two hands. So if you notice, I depress the brake pedal and you can see that this bottom piston moves out in relation to well, what our master cylinder up here is doing. So again, I apply this piston. You can see that this one moves out as a result. And then whenever I attract it, this one moves back in. So again, I'm applying the brake pedal, releasing the brake pedal. Applying the brake pedal, releasing the brake pedal. Now, unlike this guy up here, the master cylinder, the hydraulic fluid in question I'm using here is air. And here's a big problem with that. Look at what happens whenever I try to apply the brakes and I hold this piston to prevent it from moving. You can see there's a, a little problem right there. I'm, the piston basically is not coming out and that is because air is compressible. We're not able to effectively transmit that pressure inside of here. So to get around to that, what we could do is we could fill this entire system with fluid and then what you would see is that no matter if I have an opposing force here this is going to transmit that pressure throughout the system without loss and cause this thing to move out and that's ultimately what's stopping your vehicle with something like this right so instead of air we use a fluid now let's actually look a little bit closer to kind of figure out what's going on with it we know there's piston movement in here that piston movement is going to be generating hydraulic pressure and if you look closely Where's my pointer? Aha! Let's move this out of the frame. We can see there is a piston right here, but that's not the only one. We have a second piston right here. Remember, this is what they call a tandem master cylinder design. Tandem master cylinder means that they have a primary piston and a secondary piston. And each one of those pistons is going to control uh, two brake units. And we'll, we'll just stick with the disc and drum brake system for, for this one. And that's technically, that's what this master cylinder is for, because they have these proportioning valves on here. But again, later topic, later topic. Don't worry about that right now. So 
With this setup, this primary piston right here is going to be controlling, if we look right here, here's one of the fluid outlets. This one's going to go to one front wheel caliper. And then this fluid outlet is also, that's where fluid is going to be coming out of here whenever this piston moves. We're going to have fluid going to one front caliper, and then we're going to have fluid going to one rear caliper. If you notice, whenever I depress this, this secondary piston right here will also move as well. Whenever that happens, this is also going to be generating fluid pressure here, and that secondary piston is going to have a fluid outlet going to one front wheel, and then this fluid outlet is going to be going to one rear wheel. So front disc, rear drum for one piston, front disc, rear drum for the other piston. And you can kind of start to see why they do this, because what if there is a failure or some sort of, what if you have a leak on this hydraulic circuit right here? Let's just say the this one goes to the right front caliper, and this one's controlling the left front caliper. Let's just say the right front caliper right here has a leak, someone over torqued the fitting, feeding into it, and it's leaking fluid out. So the problem is this can't generate sufficient pressure. And worst case scenario, let's just say that you have a line that gets severed and there's no more brake fluid in here, right? So now it's just a bunch of air. So then you have the situation, like our syringes, to where if there's air in here and you're trying to operate via the master cylinder right here, you're trying to operate uh, the the piston or the caliper on this one well it ain't going to work if there's a bunch of air in the system right it's just going to compress so it's not going to work well we need to stop the vehicle right so that's why you have this redundancy type of system even if you have a complete failure on this side of the circuit you still have this primary piston is still controlling one disc brake one drum brake one caliper one drum right or one caliper one wheel cylinder rather so you're going to have reduced braking effort. You're only, you have the, the amount of braking power you have has been cut in half because you lost one front wheel, one rear wheel, but that's okay because we have this one as backup to actually bring your vehicle to a stop. You're not going to be winning any competitions in terms of stopping distances or stopping quickly, but the point is you're still going to have braking forces on at least two wheels. And this one's what's known as a diagonally split system, meaning one front uh, caliper and one rear. Here, let me show you real quick. So, if we do a very, very quick crap drawing, so here's an overhead view of a vehicle. So, this is going to be diagonally split, like so. So, the caliper is going to be controlling like the left front rotor, or controlling the left front caliper and the right rear wheel cylinder. Uh, we'll say that this particular circuit right here in the master cylinder is controlling these two wheels. And then the other, the secondary piston is controlling the right front caliper and the left rear wheel cylinder. So that's what they mean by uh, separate hydraulic circuits. Then you can have another system where it's split front to rear. to where both the front wheels would be the output from here. And then this output would be controlling uh, both the rear wheels. It just depends on the setup. And of course with modern uh, ABS hydraulic control, uh, systems or whenever you're dealing with uh, stability control systems, stuff like that, it certainly gets a bit more complex with the way they route uh, the hydraulic circuits. But that's sort of it in a nutshell on what's going on with that. We have one piston that controls uh, two brake units, uh, two calipers, or a caliper and a drum, it just depends on the vehicle. And the other ones, com uh, in this case, on this particular master cylinder, this one's controlling one caliper and uh, one wheel cylinder on this setup. So now let's take a closer look and kind of figure out what's going on with these guys right here. So if you look really closely, what's missing from the top, by the way, is your reservoir. That's what's going to hold the fluid and, again, allow fluid to be filled into the hydraulic system. And we're assuming those no, there's no air in the system right now. But if you look closely, again, we're looking at here's our secondary piston. I'm going to press on the primary piston just so you guys can kind of see that moving. See how it moves? like so. See these ports right here? This one and this one, this little cutaway. This larger one right here on the right, that's what's known as our inlet, also known as the replenishing ports. Both the same thing, doesn't matter what you call it. This one right here, it almost looks like it's about the same size, but in reality, let's see if this camera can pick up on this. If you look at the very, very bottom right there, it's a very, very small pinhole that it comes to. It's almost like, it's like barely a millimeter in diameter, the little hole at the bottom. That, this port is what's known as the compensating, AKA vent port. And just to give you, in case you can't really see that, 
here comes the masterful drawing again. If we look at like a cross section of the two, right here. So on the right, right here, this is our inlet. And this one right here is our compensating port. You can see just how small it narrows down to right there compared to this. So the compensating port, what that does is it compensates for something over time. Now keep in mind, your brake pads. So your brake pads, let me just stick with this drawing right here. Let me point this down so we can kind of get a better view of this. So your brake pads, if we look at a side profile, there's our backing plate, here's our brake pad. Brand new from the factory, it's got something like anywhere from 10 to 12 mil of thickness, right? So this is a wearable item. So as the calipers, and again you're going to have two brake pads on each side, as the calipers clamp against the rotor, this friction material right here is going to wear out. <laughs> dropping stuff. So this friction material is going to wear out over time. Now you're not going to have this magically run out all at once. This is going to be something that gradually happens over time. And again, if you're a relatively light breaker, you're probably going to be servicing like your brake pads, at, I don't know, we'll say like 50, 60,000 miles before you really need a brake service. Uh, for those that are have a heavy foot, heavy foot, lead foot problem, then you're going to have to service it much more quickly. But still, over time, this is something that's going to gradually happen. You're not going to hit your brake pedal a couple times and this thing's going to magically go from 10 to 12 to basically nothing like this to like 2 to 3 millimeter, the service limit on this. That's not going to happen all at once. So, if you notice, if we go back to this picture or this close up right there, if you notice this piston, and it's going to be the same thing back here, by the way, but you can clearly, you can see it a lot better on this one. So the secondary piston right here, if you notice, we have, it's kind of hidden right here, but there's a seal right there and another seal right there. This one up front, this one's responsible for building the pressure in the system. This is what's referred to as the primary cup seal. This one back here, this is a secondary seal. The... The primary cup seal right here, if you notice, let me actually get that flathead. It's got a little bit more of a precise end. So if you notice, it's slightly behind that compensating port right there. So whenever the brake pedal is released, again, on this end, I'm not applying any pressure to this side, any force. This is in the release position, which is controlled by these return springs here and here. So if we go back closer to this, there we go. If you notice, that primary cup seal is just behind the compensating port. Keep in mind, there's a bunch of fluid in here from that reservoir. So this hydraulic circuit right here that's going to one caliper, uh, that's going to the caliper and a wheel cylinder, that's going to be open and exposed to the reservoir. It's technically not a sealed system. And the question is, why do they do that? Well, keep in mind, it's compensating for something. As your brake pads, let's go back to this picture, as your brake pads wear over time, keep in mind that the pads have to be in contact with the rotor. So right here, we'll say this is the rotor, right here, just a little cross section of the rotor. So your brake pads are a, are a wearable item and the piston from the caliper assembly is basically going to maintain contact, is going to keep the pads or it's responsible for keeping the pads in contact with the rotor or, or in close proximity to it, right? Well, what's going to happen when the pads wear and our rotor, is it still going to be in this position now the pad has to travel like an inch or two before it even contacts the rotor? No. What's going to happen over time is instead of this, the rotor obviously isn't going to move as long as everything's correct, right? So the rotor stays in the same spot. Wheel bolts to the rotor. Rotor rotates with the wheel, right? The brake pad is going to move further out to maintain, oh, I wasn't even in frame, the, the pad is going to move further out to maintain contact with the rotor and in order for that to happen that means the piston that applies the brake pad also has to move out, right? Now that piston, let's go back to the syringe setup that we have over here. So this is basically what's happening, just to kind of give you some perspective. So this is a brand new pad from the factory or you just replace the brake pads, doesn't matter, right? So every time we depress the brake pedal, we know that our piston is basically going to... Ooh, this thing's sticking a little bit, hang on. Be back in business. Okay, so, uh, just change the brake pads, 
we have our master cylinder, which we know is applying the hydraulic pressures. It's necessary to have this piston move out and apply the brake pads, right? So again, depress the brake pedal, piston moves out, retract the brake pedal, piston retracts, right? But this thing's gonna wear over time, right? And to compensate for that, we know the pad down here in this frame, let me move this back out the way so we can see that, we know the pad down here is going to wear out over time. So as a result, this piston right here, if I, keep, if I move this straight down and try to align it to where the brand new pad was, you can see that, well, it's no longer, it's not aligned with it, right? It has to move further out to make sure and maintain contact with the pad. And to do that, well, let's just push this out. We have to move this out like another half an inch or so, or I'll just move this out like that because it's sticking again. If we pretend that our piston starts right here and then has to move out a little bit further, you can see there's an increase in volume, right? So that means that more fluid has to compensate or be added to this hydraulic circuit to compensate for the fact that this piston has moved out more. We have an increase in volume, right? Well, that fluid needs to come from somewhere, right? So where's it come from? The fluid comes through that compensating port from the reservoir. Anytime you release the brake pedal, a little bit of fluid is allowed to enter the hydraulic circuit if necessary. And again, the reason why it's so small like that, again, a little pinhole right there, is this is something that happens gradually over time. So they can get away with a little pinhole. Your brake pads, again, we're talking about typical service anywhere from like, and I'll give a big range on this one to kind of cover all aspects, anywhere from like 30 to 60,000 miles for the front pads. Rear pads kind of go a little bit longer. Rear shoes certainly last a little bit longer than that. But it's compensating for that pad wear over time. There's also another thing it needs to compensate for. Uh, think about it, your brakes are converting the kinetic energy of the vehicle in motion into heat energy, and your fluid's gonna absorb some of that heat energy. And for most fluids, whenever you heat them, what happens? Well, the fluid wants to expand, right? Well, if you have, back with these syringes, right? If you have an enclosed, if you have fluid in an enclosed area like this and it wants to expand, well, the result of that, if we just pretend that this thing is perfectly sealed, like from here to here, and this represents fluid wanting to expand, well, the problem with that is you can have something like this happen. The caliper piston will start moving out and applying the brakes, even if you're not actually, uh, even if you're not physically applying the brake pedal, because there's heat buildup and you're, and you're not letting the fluid actually vent properly. So that's why they include that compensating port right here to allow for fluid expansion to go into the reservoir whenever the fluid starts heating up. And again, not something that happens immediately. You're not gonna go from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to uh, 180 degrees Fahrenheit like instantaneous. No, it's gonna be gradual. The fluid will heat up a little bit. It's, just, it's natural, it's designed for that. It has a high dry boiling point and it's going to escape into that reservoir. And that's because the compensating port is open. Well, if that's open, how the heck am I able to build brake pressure? Once that primary cup seal, remember that's the one that's responsible for generating the brake pressure, once it gets to about, once it moves past the compensating port right about there, we have a sealed system. And fluid in a sealed system, we can't compress it. So the further this piston moves, pressure begins building higher and higher and higher. And you have more and more brake pressure in those hydraulic circuits. And because fluid can't be compressed, the further in you press the brake pedal, the more that that caliper piston or wheel cylinder piston will move out. And that's what's actually applying the brakes. And then of course, whenever you release the brake pedal, it naturally wants to retract. And then also to ensure that the piston retracts is we have these heavy duty return springs. Hence why you see me kind of shaking a little bit trying to move this. Cause this is, it's a pretty heavy duty spring right here. What about this one? This one seems like it's always open. That is gonna be our inlet or replenishing port. Before we talk about this, it's important to understand what these cup seals do. These cup seals are only designed to seal in one direction. If I try to apply fluid pressure from this side, the effect of these, let me draw another brilliant picture. They sort of have a shape like this to where they flare out on the ends, here and here. So if we try to apply fluid pressure from this side, they actually flare out more against the bore that they seal against. However, if you try to apply fluid pressure from this direction, 
it will actually curl in a little bit and it will let fluid bypass that seal if necessary. And that's actually an important feature because it has to do with that inlet or replenishing port. So whenever the brake pedal retracts and that piston comes back, a low pressure area can actually form in front of this seal. And that's actually, that's not a good thing. So you can see that I try to draw this back and I let go and the plunger basically goes back in. That's because whenever you have an increase in volume like this in a sealed, uh, in a sealed cylinder like this, it creates a low pressure area and the outside atmospheric pressure wants to push this back in. So that's sort of similar to what's going on inside of here. Whenever this piston retracts, it can create that action of it moving back quickly. The fluid doesn't really like to change direction, so you have a low pressure area that forms in front of here. But why is that a bad thing for having a low pressure area form right here? Well, the caliper assembly, you have a seal that's gonna prevent brake fluid from leaking past, right? And granted, calipers are less prone to this. It's more wheel cylinders are uh, more prone to this effect. But what can happen is if you have a low pressure area that forms in here, whenever the pedal retracts, that can actually draw in air past the piston seal into the hydraulic circuit. And last time I checked, air is compressible, right? So that's not a good thing. You don't want any air in the brake system. So how do we prevent a low pressure area from forming in there? That is actually the role of this inlet port right here. Whenever the brake pedal, after we apply the brakes and it retracts back, this seal will naturally want to, that cup seal will naturally want to kind of fold in like that and deform a little bit. And what happens is fluid is allowed to flow past, let me get a little bit closer so you can see this. So what happens is whenever that piston retracts, fluid's able to flow from the inlet valve or not the inlet valve, from the inlet port, also known as the replenishing port, it actually flows down through here, bypasses this seal in this direction, because remember, the cup seal is flaring up and out. It's not designed to uh, prevent fluid from coming, or it's not designed to block fluid from coming at it from this direction, but it does so from this direction, from the left side. And you can kind of see that whenever I'm moving this, how it kind of flares out. It's only designed to seal fluid pressure from this side, not this side. So again, that's whenever the piston is retracting, we have fluid that comes to the inlet port, bypasses the seal, and sort of fills this side and prevents a low pressure area from forming or prevents air from actually being drawn into the system. Now, back here, the primary piston is doing the same thing. Now, based off of this, you may be thinking that, oh, well, anytime the driver depresses the brake pedal, uh, they're causing this primary piston to move, and we have this little mechanical connection, this spring, that's what pushes this and causes that to move, right? Well, no, actually. See how that secondary piston isn't moving anymore, and the springs are compressing? Whenever you actually have the system uh, purged of air, and there's actually fluid in here, these, the primary and secondary piston move together, and the reason why that works is same thing if you look on the primary piston right here, there's our compensating port, there's our inlet port. Once, it, once that primary cup seal moves past the compensating port right there, we have a sealed system right there on the primary side. And once the pedal presses this piston even more, we have fluid that's sealed in this part of the chamber that is not compressible. And that fluid's going to be, uh, you're gonna have an increase in fluid pressure that's going to exert a force on the secondary piston and that's what causes that to move. The springs are simply to ensure that the primary piston and secondary piston retract back in their bore. Now there's a mechanical rod here and as well as on the front part of the piston, but this mechanical rod will ensure if there's a hydraulic circuit failure in this side, like if you leak all the fluid pressure out, that's going to ensure that there is still a mechanical force to apply the secondary piston right there. Obviously there's like, there's more stuff. There's, there's a lot to talk about on this. So this master cylinder, this is what's known as a tandem master cylinder design, and this one in particular is a quick take up or step bore master cylinder. Now the reason why they call that that name is if you look here on the, well, let's look at the secondary piston first. Now it may be kind of difficult to see, but the piston is the same size here and here, and that's easier to tell if you actually look at the bore, the cylinder size it's the same diameter. However, 
you look right here, the front part of this piston, the diameter of this, is smaller compared to back here. And you can clearly see, see how the casting, how it kind of flares out like this to accommodate it? This back part of the cylinder has a larger volume right here. And that's because of the fact this piston back here, again, this is all one piece. This piston has a larger diameter or surface area compared to this front one right here. Now, why do they do something like that? Well, this uh, quick take up design is used on low drag brake calipers. Now, low drag calipers are designed to maintain a larger running gap or clearance in between the pads and the rotors. And they do this for fuel efficiency purposes. Uh, they do it for a reduction of noise because they don't want the pad to be in contact with the rotor and have customers complain about that. And anything they can do to get a small improvement in fuel economy, they're absolutely going to do that. But that's a big problem. If you have a large, and again, this is uh, exaggerated in this picture. If you have a large gap in between the pad and the rotor, well, that translates to the driver having to depress the brake pedal more and physically having to move this. Here, let me get our familiar plunger set up. So the problem is if you use, if we have a low drag caliper and use it with a normal master cylinder, and let's just say that uh, our rotor, I have all sorts of crap around here. Let's just say this represents our rotor. And this end right here we'll say represents the pad. And we're gonna exaggerate if we have a big gap between here and here. So the problem with that is the driver depresses the brake pedal, depresses the brake pedal, depresses the brake pedal, depresses the brake pedal, depresses the brake pedal. And then it finally comes into contact with the rotor. And then from that point on, they have to keep depressing it for it to actually slow the vehicle down. So there's a lot of excess travel that you have to do to take up the slack on there with a normal master cylinder. So what can be done about that? Well, with this step bore design, they use a piston, or the front of the piston is smaller in diameter compared to the back of the piston. And we have basically a small chamber and a large chamber. And right here, we have a little quick take-up valve. It's just a little check valve, basically. And I'll talk about this in just a second. So whenever the driver depresses the brake pedal, they actually, when I explained about the cup seals, has a lot to do with how this thing works. So because of the fact that there is a larger volume of fluid right here compared to this front part, well, whenever the piston starts, whenever the driver starts depressing the brake pedal, this is going to try to push much more fluid in comparison to this front part of the chamber. And so the result is that basically fluid will bypass the cup seal in this direction. And remember, it's designed to do that. Fluid can bypass the seal from this direction. So whenever the driver applies the brakes, this will bypass that seal because, again, we're trying to push a lot more fluid volume compared to this front part of this piston because, again, smaller diameter, smaller volume chamber, larger diameter, larger volume chamber right here. So whenever the pedal's depressed, fluid is going to flow into that hydraulic circuit. Whenever the driver starts depressing the brake pedal, instead of a small piston movement like this, because of the fact that we have excess fluid, or not excess fluid, but because of the fact that we're pushing more fluid physically into our hydraulic circuit, the caliper is going to move out at a much faster rate and come into contact with the rotor uh, with minimal uh, pedal movement as a result. So it takes up the slack and then once it contact, once the pad contacts the rotor, then there's some resistance. And then finally, this can start building proper brake pressure in here. But then you may be asking yourself, well, this piston right here, the large part is still trying to push excess fluid for there, uh, through here, but now we're starting to have pressure build up in the system. Now the seal flares out against the cylinder prevents fluid from going back there, prevents fluid from going through there. So what's gonna happen at this point? That's where this check valve comes into play. So let me go ahead and pop this out. So this check valve right here, if we look in the middle, this thing will focus. So you see the little check ball right there? If I press on it, see there's a little, I don't know how well you can see that, but this check ball mechanism, this valve basically, is very similar to like a transmission check valve. Uh, on this, there's a little internal spring and it keeps it seated against here. Well, a certain force or pressure can cause this to open and then it allows fluid to basically come out. So once this hydraulic circuit starts building pressure like normal and we no longer, again, need to take up any excessive slack in between the pads and the rotor, our piston has moved the pad into contact with the rotor and this is still trying to push uh, a lot of fluid. Well, it pushes it up through the inlet port 
and it'll cause the excess pressure that starts building up on here, or the increase in pressure here rather, uh, that check valve will open and allow fluid to go back up into the reservoir. And that's what the step bore master cylinder actually does. So one more thing I'm going to talk about. This video is already way too long, and I can't even remember if I said this is supposed to be a short video, but you know how it goes. There's, there's a lot to talk about. So we're not going to talk about proportion valves in this one. All you need to know about this is within here, there's a little valve that moves, and it's going to limit brake pressure to the rear wheels under uh, very heavy braking or panic stop situations. We don't want the rear wheels to lock up because any time... Uh, if you're driving your vehicle, if you notice, you step on the brakes. I'm trying to get my hand horizontal on this. Um, if the vehicle's traveling in a straight line, you step on the brake pedal, you notice that the vehicle will tend, the weight will tend to want to kind of shift towards the front. That weight transfers to the front. Your front brakes do the majority of the vehicle braking. And so you want to limit the brake pressure to the rear wheels. Uh, and on this setup, they use proportioning valves with a modern hydraulic uh, control system. Uh, electronic brake control system like uh, uh, ABS, stability control, traction control, stuff like that. It's a lot more sophisticated control over the wheels. But on this one, this is strictly done uh, hydraulically, or it's a pressure sensitive type of system on there. So it's going to limit the brake pressure to the rear wheels, prevent the rear wheels from locking off. So like a primitive type of ABS, if you will, for the rear wheels. But we're not going to talk about that. What we are going to talk about is this interesting valve right here. This is what's known as a pressure differential valve. This outlet port here goes to a front caliper, and this one goes to a rear wheel cylinder. And those ports, that's the uh, secondary pistons responsible for building pressure in those hydraulic circuits, right? So coming off of there, whenever again the driver depresses the brake pedal, moves that push rod, and then begins building pressure in the system, this is going to be one of those outlet ports, and it comes through here. And if I poke it through, you can actually kind of see it. I'm going through the front caliper outlet port, and you can see it kind of cuts through there. So this is going to be one of the pressure outlets. And then this one, you're not going to be able to see this one, but basically it passes up, and the, the outlet port for that is like down here. We're, we're not going to be able to see that. But basically, we have an outlet. We have this little hydraulic port right here. And then it kind of, we have this little chamber right here to the left of this differential valve. If you look for the primary piston, for its hydraulic circuit, it also has the same thing. This one also is going to be an outlet for the one of the front calipers, one of the rear wheel cylinders. This passes through there, and again, you can see it's a hollow passage for fluid to pass through, right? It's also going to be going to have a little passageway on the right side of that pressure differential valve. So what is this for? They have a pressure differential valve to monitor for any loss of pressure or reduce pressure in one of these braking circuits, these hydraulic circuits, right? And right here, we have a little pressure warning switch. So, what is this for? Why do they have this thing? Well, this is to alert the driver uh, to let them know of a potential brake system issue. And on this one, it's just going to illuminate the brake warning light, which we know will come on even if you uh, pull up the parking brake, you have a brake warning light that comes on. But it can also be triggered by low brake fluid level, or it can, be for, it can be triggered by something like this, your pressure differential valve moving because you have a loss of pressure somewhere in your braking circuit. So for instance, this is again why we use the tandem master cylinder, and if there's a failure in one brake circuit, we always have a backup uh, redundant system to make sure we can actually stop the vehicle and get it to a, a repair facility, right? Let's just say there's a loss of pressure in the secondary brake circuit, and that means that one caliper uh, one front caliper and one wheel cylinder isn't getting proper pressure. There's a leak somewhere. Let's just say somebody uh, cranked down on one of the uh, caliper fittings on there, over tightened it, or one of like the bleed valves, and it's leaking. And so we no longer have a sealed system. Pascal's law, again, that's not going to take into effect anymore. We have reduced pressure in the system because it's no longer a sealed system. So we can't build proper pressure. So what's going to happen is anytime the driver depresses the brake pedal like this, this pressure differential valve is going to see pretty much equal pressure on both sides of this valve, right? However, if there is a pressure loss on one side like we are simulating in this one, that means this has a lower pressure on one side compared to the other. So since there is a higher pressure on the right side compared to the left side, there is a pressure differential. There is a greater force that's being applied from the right side compared to the left. Because of that, 
this valve will want to move to the right. And let's see if I can get this to move. And you can see that's the result of that. Now what does that actually do? It's like, okay, a big whoop, the valve moves. What's, what's that going to do? Well, if you we look closely, we can see this valve right here has this little notch right here. And if I move it back to its at rest position, pay close attention to this little switch plunger right here as I move it back in the middle. You can see that switch extends out and lands nicely in that little notch right there. So what happens, again, and I'll move it from the other side just so you can see it moving in both directions. Let's just say that we have a pressure loss in the primary circuit. Secondary circuit is going to have higher pressure on the left now compared to the right. So there is a net force that's going to push the pressure differential valve to the right. You can see as it moves, it's going to press down on that switch. And inside of here, there's a set of switch contacts. Now these can be normally open or normally closed, it just depends on the design. And whenever that happens, we'll say the switch contacts close on this one, I believe that's how this one's set up. And the result is the computer sees a voltage change and it's going to illuminate the brake warning light. And actually I'll get my multimeter and we'll see if this thing works. Okay, so what I've done is I have my multimeter tied into the input for this pressure differential switch, or sensor I guess you could call it but it's basically a switch in there. And then the other end of the multimeter is just gonna be grounded to the housing of the master cylinder assembly. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this valve so you can see this in real time. And we should see a change on here. So right now it's OL, uh, it's out of range, but in this case we have an open circuit. Now in this case, we're going to simulate like we have a pressure loss on this side of the circuit. So whenever we do that, let's actually see what happens. So the Pressure differential valve is going to move as a result of that pressure loss and it's going to depress that plunger on the switch and you can see that now we have continuity in between this point. The switch contacts have closed now. I'm going to actually turn that. Oh, you can see it okay in the video. Uh, but the plunger has moved those switch contacts, they've closed and now there's a complete circuit between here and here. Now if you notice on here, uh, and I only know this because of the fact that I was messing with this a little bit. Um, you can see that our resistance readings go pretty high, and that's probably because inside that switch is pretty crusty. I'm not sure how long this simulator's been sitting around for, so this, con this, this switch probably needs to be opened up and cleaned, but that is definitely not normal. Switch contacts, uh, you're not supposed to have any real resistance on there, because this would cause a voltage drop issue on the vehicle and lead to uh, all sorts of weird problems on here. But again, this is all that's gonna happen is the, uh, the control module or they'll they'll have this directly wired to the for the brake warning illumination but a lot of the times they have it wired to the control module uh, once it sees that voltage change from the contacts closing or opening depends on the design in this case it closes then it knows to illuminate the brake warning lamp and let me actually show you real quick let me take these contacts off let me do a quick drawing to kind of show you what i'm talking about okay let's explain what we're looking at here so here we have a control module layout Right here, actually, I forgot to label this. Uh, here we have our pressure differential uh, sensor or switch right there. And these contacts are normally, are normally open. So our control module is monitoring what's going on with the switch. And here we're just using a 5 volt reference. It can be 12 volts, doesn't matter. There's a current limiting resistor, and this is our voltage sensing circuit. So basically, if you were to, this is why this thing only has one pin. Well, actually, let me put this right here. So. If you notice, this switch only has uh, one pin input. And every circuit needs a complete path to ground for current to flow, right? So how do they get away with that? Or what's actually going on? Well, if you measure the voltage going to this whenever the... I keep going out of frame. If you measure the voltage going to this whenever the switch is open, you should have voltage. And all that changes whenever the contacts close. And that's because of this circuit right here. And again, I'm just generalizing on uh, on the vehicle that this master cylinder came out of. It could directly control the lighting circuit, but you're gonna have stuff like this on a lot of vehicles. So we'll just say we're using a five volt reference, current limiting resistor, voltage sensing circuit right here. There's our pressure differential switch. Contacts are normally open whenever the pressure differential valve has not moved. And then there's our ground. And over here we have our brake warning lamp that's gonna be controlled by the control module right here. So right now, uh, after the current limiting resistor, this control module is going to see 5 volts in the voltage sensing circuit right here. 
However, if there's a pressure loss inside of the master cylinder, we know that, that pressure differential valve is going to move, and the result is it's going to close these contacts. So our voltage sensing circuit in this layout is going to drop to basically close to zero because there's a voltage drop across the current limiting resistor. There's no real load on this side of the circuit, so this current limiting resistor is going to see most of that voltage drop. Again, that's the only real main load of the circuit, so it's going to see something like, uh, we'll say like 0.1 volt after the load, right? So it recognizes that voltage change as, hey, something's going on with that pressure switch, the contact's closed, there's a pressure drop in the system, of course the computer's not that smart, it just knows once I see this voltage, I know to output a voltage to this circuit to illuminate the brake warning lamp. Or, the, or, it could just, or it could ground the circuit out. It's the same thing. It can either send power to the circuit or it can ground it out to complete the path. And the result is, well, your warning lamp illuminates, right? And the driver doesn't know what's going on. It's just a brake warning indicator like this. But a lot of the times on these new vehicles, on the infotainment center, they'll give you an actual message to kind of uh, be more specific about what the problem actually is. But yeah, that's sort of it in a nutshell on what's going on with a typical uh, way that a control module is going to be looking at a specific input switch and also one more thing I know I know videos already run on for days it seems like but on this one we simulated that something uh, I forgot if I said right front left front caliper doesn't matter we'll say this controls the right front caliper right here the one where somebody over torqued a uh, the bleed screw on there and it's leaking out of the fitting they have to replace the caliper because they de uh, destroyed the seat on there uh, so that's all fine and dandy, and or actually no, it would be the other way around. Let's move this pressure differential valve back over here, hopefully without breaking anything. So our issue is we had a leak on this side because our valve moved over to the left in this simulation. So we said one caliper, again somebody over torqued it, whatever. We repaired it, it's good to go. The problem is whenever you bleed the brakes and get it all back to normal, this valve is still going to be in this position. It's still going to be stuck to the left, so how do we get this thing to go back over to the right? Well, you actually have to cause, whenever you bleed the brakes, you have to actually create a low pressure condition on this side of the circuit whenever you're bleeding it. And it usually involves a little bit of finagling to where uh, somebody has to sit inside of the vehicle and whenever they're bleeding the brakes, you basically clack, crack open like a bleed screw on this side of the circuit, and this is going to see a pressure loss compared to this side of the circuit and you have to get it and time it just right to where whenever this moves over and you see the brake warning light go out, you basically have somebody in the driver's seat going, hey, hey, stop, close the bleeder valve. And then, yeah, it's a little bit of fiddling around. I know they make a special service tool to keep this pressure differential valve uh, centered to where you take this out and insert like a bolt with a little lead that comes down and prevents it from moving. But yeah, there's a little bit of fiddling going around with this to get it to go back to the middle. It's kind of silly, but again, luckily most of the time, uh, this thing won't operate unless there's a problem in the system. And if you're really, really lucky, this thing is bound up and with a bunch of gunk and crap and it, it won't move anyway, even if they have a problem. So again, these uh, master cylinders aren't really typically used as much anymore in modern vehicles. Again, modern vehicles, it's much more sleeker. Now you're dealing with electrohydraulic braking systems, uh, definitely a lot more complexity. But hopefully this will give you some insight on what's going on with the master cylinder assembly. And if you stuck around this long and watched the whole thing, uh, kudos to you. I hope you learned something.